Um, so anyway, um, we're going to talk about a little bit about uh, big data, which is kind of the theme of this conference to an extent. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about big data and um, how do you integrate all that data and what do you do with it. Uh, but I will, f I will show off some of the British features that you probably have seen before, um, but um, I will also focus on some of the research projects that we're working on that, that, that are a little bit different from what you've seen before, probably. So I'm sure you're all familiar with something like this. On your way to work, I know I see it all the time. Um, and as a driver, when you look at it from a customer's perspective, um, I don't really care who's managing the road. Um, I don't care if it's uh, Virginia Department of Transportation, DC, Maryland, especially in those types of regions where there are many jurisdictions working um, together. You don't really care what's going on. You just know that you're stuck in this traffic and you're not getting to where you need to be in time. So historically, those agencies um, had their own maps and, and, and ways of uh, managing traffic, and they did a good job with that. They had their own um, sensors. They were tracking incidents. They were doing all that. Uh, for their region, and as I said, they were doing a good job. Then you go to Maryland, and they're doing the same stuff on their side, and, and, and they're doing a good job there as well. And you kind of see where I'm going with this. Um, as a driver, what I really want to see is this, and fortunately, over the last decade or so, the col collaboration between these agencies has improved significantly, and it's allowed um, a, a lot of improvements in, in the congestion, um, in management of incidents, um, safety, many other things. And um, so other than seeing this anecdote and, and, and seeing this pretty map, um, that's, by the way, where that traffic jam was right on the border between the two jurisdictions. Um, what are the, the numbers behind this? Well, um, Metropolitan Area Transportation Operations uh, coordination program, MATOC, in uh, DC area has done some benefit cost analysis and, and published a paper that looked at um, coordination in the region to figure out what, um, what that coordination really translates into when you look at, um, at, the, at the financial portion of it. And so what they did is they looked at some incidents and they came up with uh, some numbers and I actually did not put in, um, they have specific um, costs associated with each one of the um, uh, gases, but what they did is they looked at emissions and they found that about $12,000 was, uh, um, was saved by, the, um, by MATOC um, in terms of emissions, fuel consumption about $4,500, and value of time about $323,000 for a total of $340,000 saved by having this coordination in the region versus not having any coordination. So even though those individuals, ag individual agencies were doing a good job managing their own uh, transportation systems, as a whole, the system has benefited uh, significantly, and this is per incident. So if you're looking at it, it's 10 to 1 return on investment over a, a single year. And if you were in a presentation earlier this morning, um, uh, Mort from uh, Caltrans uh, District 12 was talking about a similar, um, similar um, study that they've done, and they found something um, along the lines of 9 to 1 um, return on investment. So, so it's pretty close. Um, and this is a conservative an analysis, so, so this did not take into account um, the, the reduced prob probability of secondary incidents, um, which, you know, the probability of those grows the more the the queue is present and the, the longer the incident is on the road. Uh, secondary queues um, and what happens when you have multiple or regional incidents. Um, if you did not have this type of a coordination, the benefits uh, are, are probably significantly larger with the coordination. So on the research side, why, why, should, we, um, why should we collaborate? So one of the things that we found at, at the University of Maryland is that a lot of times Researchers spend um, almost 50% or up to 50% of their research money just trying to find the data, to format it in the, in the, in the uh, way that they can use it, um, to, to make sense of it, and then apply it to, to do their um, um, research and, and solve the problem. So 50% of that time and money is wasted just looking for data. So the goal of collaboration and sharing of this data is to try to put it all together into a single location so that you can take nearly 100% of that um, research money and use it to actually solve the problem. 
And if you could do that, um, I think we would go much further in, in, in the research that we do. The other thing that, that um, comes up is the, the whole idea of open data, and I'm sure you've been hearing about this a lot. But one of the things that we've found is that um, DOTs actually prefer to have this data open and available um, to, to, um, to researchers and to other groups because uh, they're not burdened with data requests. They don't have people calling them all the time and saying, hey, I need you know, a data dump for this and that. Um, they can just go and get it for themselves. Um, it fosters innovation, and, and this is kind of clear in, in itself. Um, and then the combined data value add, so sometimes you might have some data and uh, your neighboring jurisdiction might have some other data, and on their own they have certain value, but when you put them together you really get some um, additional value that you wouldn't have otherwise. So what, what are some of the challenges? Some of the challenges are this whole idea of big data. Um, when you look at the traffic events, and this, these are some statistics that I took out of a regional integrated transportation information system, better known as RIDIS, um, you look at about 7,000 records per day for traffic events uh, for, the, for the DOTs that we're uh, currently working with. So, you know, that's not really big data, but that's, that's important. Um, then you look at traffic detectors, and now you're getting into a realm of 35 million records, and that's you know, that's, that's a bigger number of records, but that's still only about five gigabytes per day. That's not really that big of a deal. Once you get into probe vehicle data, now you're talking about big data, at least in my opinion. Uh, you're talking about 4.2 billion records per day, or about half a terabyte. And that's what we're uh, trying to handle right now, and it's a challenge, because um, you handle that data quite differently than you would your 7,000 um, incident records. But I would postulate, and I, I'm sure most of you would agree, is that they're just as critical and important, both of them. And then as we're moving to connected vehicle, if, uh, if you decide to start pulling that data in and doing something with it, uh, the frequency and the amount of data, that data might be um, even, even larger. So what is the second challenge? And I think, uh, Amanda, you kind of touched on this in terms of getting data from, from different sources. So different sources store it in a different way and they want to share it in a different way. So they're all trying to cram it into the um, this single database, this single point where everybody will look for data. And that's, that's a challenge. Uh, but, but it's something that can be overcome. And, and I know uh, at the University of Maryland, we've worked hard to make it easy for DOTs, for state agencies, for uh, local agencies to provide this data in whatever format they can and then try to uh, format it in a way that everything uh, looks uniform and can be presented in some meaningful way without losing significant value or um, a, a data that, that you might have gotten. The third challenge, and, and I, I believe a lot of people think this is one of the biggest challenges when it comes to integrating data, is this whole idea of liability and data sensitivity. And I, and I hope there are no lawyers here, and if there are, I apologize about this, uh, this picture. It's actually good you can't read it. Uh, but um, what, what happens is you have this data that you're collecting, operational data, and you're worried about the, the security, you're worried about who's seeing that data, what they're doing with it, and then you're also worried about, well, what if I posted something on a sign and it wasn't quite right, or what if I announced that there's an incident on the road and it wasn't there? Um, am I gonna have the general public come back and sue me for it? Um, and that, that's, to an extent, it's, it's a valid uh, train of thought, but there are agencies out there that, that have overcome this and have gotten significant benefits with just opening their data and letting it go, um, and, and really, for example, um, uh, California Highway Patrol, um, their CAD system used to be um, pretty closed and they would um, collect all this data, but they would be receiving a lot of phone calls from general public saying, you know, what is going on? Why are we having issues here and there? Uh, so much so that a lot of their resources would um, be taken up by just trying to respond to these. Uh, once they opened it up, and they, I think they opened up pretty much everything and just put it up on a website, uh, once they did that, the number of calls dropped significantly. Um, I'm not aware of any lawsuits quite yet, and uh, they've been more than happy with the fact that they're able to do their job and concentrate on actually managing the roads as opposed to um, responding to, to phone calls. So that's one of the fears that, that definitely needs to be addressed. So what we did with Redis is we tried to act as that central point that everybody tries to put the data into. So we've done some work to 
try to um, um, standardize that data, and I'm using the word standardize in a, in a loose manner here, but really just try to find some uh, common way of presenting that data without losing a lot of information, um, and then providing it out to other agencies so that they can coordinate uh, for operational use. And then we also worked with the general public, uh, media, to provide uh, the data that the DOTs are comfortable providing um, and, and re relieving them from some of the duties of dealing with that. So some, uh, some of the um, user statistics, we have about 3,000 users currently. Uh, we have um, many more thousands via third-party applications, so the data that we're providing uh, to other um, uh, third parties. Um, and you will notice in this list of uh, data users and, and RITUS users, it's not all DOTs. Um, there's a, a fair number of public agencies, um, police, um, NSA, military, um, Homeland Security. So we have a pretty diverse group of people, but I think the, the, the whole idea here is that all these folks are looking to coordinate and get a better situational awareness and really be able, able to collaborate and share data. Um, and that's, that's kind of presented through, through this um, diverse group of users. So I was going to do a live demo, uh, but when I hooked up my laptop earlier before the, the session, it actually didn't work trying to uh, um, show it on the, on the screen. Fortunately, I have a ton of screenshots that I took um, prior to this. So I'm going to run through some of the RITUS um, information and um, show of hands how, how many of you have seen RITUS in the past, so that I don't go over everything. Okay, so not as not not that many people. So I'll I'll go through some of these. I'll I'll kind of go through quickly because there's a lot of different features, and I'm not going to hit on all of them. If you have questions or something specific, please uh, um, you know grab me afterwards, or um, you know we can go in the hallway. We have a booth. We can show you some additional information. So. What we do is uh, we, we, we're collecting all this data. We try to integrate it. So what you're seeing here is um, a, an incident list that shows you um, the locations of uh, incidents in, in real time, the um, agencies that have been reporting it, what are some of the um, day, um, incident types, lane closures. So it's just kind of giving you an idea, um, a quick overview of what's going on in the region. And you can do different types of filtering. Um, you can look at the specific regions, you can filter out certain um, incident types, you can actually um, filter out all the incidents that have less than 30% of the lanes closed or something along those lines. So you can customize this to, uh, to your liking. And then the map view of it, um, so we have, uh, we have the weather information, we have um, incident information, uh, we have the speed data um, that's uh, coming from probe vehicles. Um, this is Somewhat outdated picture, uh, but it shows the uh, the incident coverage that we have currently. We have built a night view mode. Um, a lot of TMCs that we work with that use RITUS um, have complained that it's difficult to see because it's so bright. So we built a TMC view, which seems to be um, um, addressing that issue. We we're integrating um, weather data. So so you know this is the whole idea of integrating big sets of data. So we're taking a, a weather forecast and we're trying to overlay them on the same map so you can see, um, I can't really read this, but each one of these represents certain forecast um, temperatures. And then we also collect the um, weather alerts. So you can see clusters of weather alerts based on uh, what's going on in the region. You can read what the alert is, and this is all coming from National Weather Service. Um, so we're pulling their data and, and overlaying it on this map. Some other things that we're pulling in are, um, th these are um, road weather information stations. Um, um, we have national coverage for those, and what you can do is you can click on any one of these, and it'll show you some uh, basic information, the, the uh, wind speeds and direction, um, air and pavement temperatures. If there's a reduced visibility, it'll tell you what it is, what are the road conditions, and so on. Um, there's also an advanced view. Um, these sensors collect a lot more data. Again, it's the idea of, you know, the level of information that you, you're interested in. So if you're a weather person or, or you're doing some uh, winter weather maintenance, you probably want to uh, see more details about what that sensor is showing. Um, I mentioned this earlier in a, in a presentation as well. One of the things that 
um, a lot of folks in TMCs use is um, the radio communication. So they're communicating at all times. What we've tried to do is um, integrate the radio scanners across the nation. So if you have an incident, you can click on one of these and it will actually play the, the police, uh, fire, and, and EMS scanners. So you can um, see what the response is. So I'm zooming in here into a, a region. You can see some uh, weather patterns here, some rain coming in, um, incidents. Um, the little pluses on the incidents represent uh, clustering of incidents. So as you zoom in, you can see some more detail here. You can see these uh, red lines represent um, slow traffic. What we're doing is we're actually collecting probe data and we're archiving it indefinitely. And so we can compare the normal speeds for that time of the day, that particular day, and show only the things that are um, different. So in this case, the red areas here are things that are slower than normal. Otherwise, if you're familiar with DC area, if you were to show the raw speed data, uh, most of this would be all yellow and red. We also have the dynamic message signs. Um, they show what, whatever the, the uh, messages are on that particular sign. Um, we have video that we've integrated, so you can, um, you can pull up uh, video feeds. Um, these little blue dots represent the video feeds. Um, and what you can do is you can actually build your own video wall. So you can just keep adding them to this window and resizing them and you can move each one of these. So if I drag this one up here, it would uh, take up that spot. Or if you want to get rid of a camera, you would just drag it to the side and there's a little trash bin here that shows up and you can just dump it. Um, what we've done is we actually, all the processing is being done on the server side. So what you're seeing here is um, on, the, on the client side, you can actually pull up up to 64 video feeds before your browser starts uh, being sluggish. So, you know, you can build your own uh, video wallet, which, uh, whatever configuration that you would like. So these are some, uh, some of the additional information that you get about incidents, the lane closures, the locations. Um, that happens when you click on any one of these um, um, icons. So you can get some additional information. There's this timeline button that I will not show you um, um, the tool that, that it links to, but it's something that we can talk about later. But it's really trying to look at all this data you know, on a single page for that particular incident. So it's trying to give you a situational awareness um, um, for that particular incident. Other things that we have is we've integrated the FITM plans. And actually, some of you probably know what that stands for. I think it's freeway incident management something or other, but it's basically whenever they have um, um, entire road closure or significant number of lanes closed, these are the plans that are being implemented um, that are pre-planned and so it shows you where the, if the closure is right here, these are your um, traffic control points and these are your reroutes and um, it, it tells you some information about how you should retime the signals and uh, whatever else you need to do to, to make this detour uh, uh, working. We have some, uh, uh, in addition to probe data, we also have the, um, the sensor data that's coming from point sensors. So all these little green um, triangles represent sensors. They're colored by speed. And if you click on them, you can see the last 12 hours of speed and volume information. So you can kind of uh, get an idea of what's going on. Some of these um, provide data in one minute intervals. Some provide them in five minute intervals. We have the, um, transit data, we've just started um, actually uh, integrating some of this transit data. So this is uh, metro lines in DC. And if you click on a, on a metro stop, it will actually show you the current um, time, arrival, arrival times for the, for the metros, how many cars they have, and so on. Uh, we do something similar for the buses in the area, where uh, we we're collecting AVL data from the buses and displaying their um, uh, bus stops, the um, expected uh, arrival times, and then if the bus is actually moving around, there will be a little triangle that um, travels around, around the, the map. So, so that's a very quick overview of Redis. So as I said, if you have additional questions or something was not clear since I kind of went through it quickly, feel free to talk to me afterwards. But what I really wanted to talk about is this whole idea of the more, more research applications of this data. So you're integrating all this big data. There's a lot of collaboration, and it's great for operational use. Uh, but what we did is we developed this tool that 
uh, concentrates more on, okay, I don't know what the specific question is. I know you have all this data, so give me all the data and I'll just figure out if I find the patterns or, or um, something specific that I'm interested in. Um, so it's not, it's not a question, it's just, okay, let me just look at the data. So what, what I did here is I loaded the data for uh, Maryland, D.C., and Virginia um, for a time period of three months um, in, in this, in this um, application. And what I'm doing is I'm showing you three different panels here. So there's a map view. There's this um, view of um, graphics that, um, that um, represents this different data types. And then in here, I'm actually showing you all the different uh, variables that we have in the database so that you can go and explore on your own what you're interested in. All the three views are actually connected together so that as you navigate one of them, um, the other ones change as well. So in this case, uh, when you started, you, um, I clicked on the county variable here and what it does is it changes this view and it shows me all the counties uh, for this region and it shows me a histogram of um, number of incidents that were occurring in that county for that time period. So you can see that um, Baltimore, Anne Arundel, um, I can't actually read all of these. Um, Fairfax had a, a pretty high number of incidents. This is a heat map that shows you where the incidents are and even without seeing the road network below, you can kind of guess that this is a I-95, 495, I-66, 270, 70, 695. These are all the usual suspects, but these are, these are the major interstates in the region that, um, that frequently have um, accidents. So what you can do is now you can modify some of these views to uh, get a better idea. So as I mentioned, uh, as you click on things, they change. So what I clicked on, I clicked on incident type variable in the list here. And now it's showing me all the different incident types. And then what I did is I clicked on um, disabled on shoulder um, um, bar here. And what it does is it gives me, I switched the view as well. So I've done three different things here. Uh, <laughs> trying to show all three at the same time. I uh, switch the di different view, so what you can see is um, it's showing you the percentage of, um, of incidents in that area that are disabled vehicles on the shoulder. Um, now this part is in the development, so we don't have the numbers, but we'll add the numbers there so it, it's a little clearer. But you can see that some areas have more, um, um, for example, this area has a lot of uh, disabled vehicles whereas this one has a lot of different types of um, incidents. So you can kind of click around on e each one of these and figure out where they, where they are. You can also switch it to actual point view. So now you're seeing every single incident um, on its own. And again, I'm selecting the disabled on the shoulder. So now you can see where those are. Uh, whether or not that's useful is, is uh, you know, uh, up for a debate. But you can, you can kind of see the distribution of those. Now, I clicked on a different one here. This is the created um, uh, date um, variable. And now I'm seeing here, because I mentioned I uh, selected three months worth of data, so we have um, August, September, and October. October, we're still in October, so there are a few days left, so that one's um, a little shorter than the other ones, but you can see that August had more incidents than uh, September did. And then what you can do is if you click on, um, so I clicked on a, August, when you click on August, it'll actually break it down now per day of the month. And now you can see a pattern here. It's not a particularly interesting pattern, but you can see a pattern that, um, you know, you have your work days, weekend, your work days, weekend, and so on. Um, so you can kind of get an idea of um, what's going on. And let's say that this is not a particularly interesting set of data, but as I said, uh, you know, I didn't have any specific questions. I was just kind of playing around with it. So what you can do is you can, let's say you saw something, you can click on one of these and drill down into that particular day. So I think I picked a day and I drilled down and now I'm seeing the distribution by hour. And so you'll see 5 a.m., 6, 7, 8, 9 a.m. had the most incidents, then it kind of drops down and then your evening rush hour, there are some incidents. So it seems like the morning rush hour on this particular day had more incidents across these two states or three states, two states in a district. Um, than, than the evening rush hour. And then up here, um, I just wanted to show you, you can actually uh, click on each one of these dots if you choose to do so, and it'll give you additional information about 
um, that incident, what the type is, when it happened, and you can click on this show timeline button, which will show you that neat tool that I wasn't showing you earlier. Uh, but again, you can talk to me afterwards, and um, it just gives you an idea of all the information that was associated with that particular event. So in addition to seeing those histograms, you can switch to different views of the, of the graphs. So down here, this is a two-dimensional plot now, and you can select any two variables. So what you can see is how those variables are correlating to each other. In this particular case, I picked county and incident type. So on x-axis are my counties, on y-axis are my incident types, and unfortunately I can't read it, but certain counties are reporting, um, and I think this is consistent with the previous graph that the, this is a disabled vehicle. So the dark blue ones mean that there are more correlations between this county and that disabled vehicle. And so, again, not significantly interesting here, but there are times that you might notice that a particular county has a large number of, I don't know, weather events, for example, and, and maybe you can explore that in more, more depth. Um, again, I clicked on this particular, so Baltimore County disabled vehicles, and it's showing me Baltimore County disabled vehicles on the map. Here's a crazier graph. Um, it's parallel coordinates graph. Now, what this does is it gives you an ability to select variables. So each one of these vertical line bars represents a variable, and each red dot represents a value of that variable. And then the lines are incidents. So incidents that converge to a variable are the ones that are interesting, or the variables that all incidents converge to are interesting. So in this particular case, um, I don't remember which variables I selected here, but um, it looks like there's a, a large number of, uh, of incidents that are of this type, and I think this is vehicles involved, so most of them have one or zero vehicles involved. And then, I don't remember what this one was, but you can see that there's only a few that have more than one vehicle involved, and this is probably I don't know what that is, but there's a single incident that had a ton of vehicles involved, so it could have been a really bad accident. And what's interesting is you can click on these clusters of lines or even this individual line, and it will highlight where those incidents are. So if I clicked on this individual line, I could probably see where that incident was, pull up that timeline, and figure out exactly what happened. So it's kind of a different view um, that's trying to extrapolate some um, patterns out of it. So in addition to doing the single variable analysis that I was just uh, showing you, um, you can also do um, some statistical analysis across multiple variables. And so there's a list of these different statistical functions. Um, and what I did is I ran um, one of them. Let's see. OK, so I ran um, a function that um, does the standard deviation or the st correlation between two variables. And what it does is, is it provides this uh, co correlation uh, coefficient and it colors it. So the things that are green are highly correlated, the things that are uh, kind of light green are less correlated, and then red ones are not very correlated. And the idea behind this is that you can look for things that you might have not thought about that might matter to each other. So there are multiple variables that might be correlated in some way. Um, now, the ones that are, f you know, fully co correlated, they have value of one, usually are not very interesting because it's, you know, the created date and the uh, created time. Well, you know, most of the time, if you create something on this date and this time, you know, they're same, so they're going to have correlation of one. So those are not that interesting, but those that have some correlation but not what you would expect are interesting. So this one I found um, about an hour ago when I was playing with it. Um, it was uh, created time and cleared time. So when the event was created and then when the road was cleared. And what was interesting, I used a different visualization of this plot. But what it's showing is uh, this is the created, uh, this is the closed time, this is the created time. And what you're seeing is most events are created and closed pretty close together. And the color tells you how many incidents uh, follow that pattern. So, you know. In the middle of the night, not many incidents are there, and then throughout the day, you're getting some morning rush hour, so you get a lot of incidents, and they're closed, they're opened and closed at the same, uh, you know, close to each other, same in the evening. But then what you see is these 
weird patterns that, that come out that actually when I saw it, I was like, well, what is this? And I looked into it a little more. So what ends up um, coming out of this is that there is a fair number of incidents in the morning rush hour that get opened, but they don't get closed until later on in the day. In fact, they're getting closed in the afternoon. So um, what could be happening, and this is me now guessing, and if you were to run this, you could guess what it is. But you know, this could mean that there are a lot of times there are incidents that happen in the morning rush hour, and so you just move them over into the shoulder until the rush hour ends, and then you come back later on to clear it up. So if that's a, a major incident or something like that. And during that time, the traffic management center still keeps track of that incident. They don't close it because it's still there. Um, they're just not doing anything with it. So that could be a pattern that you're seeing here. And it's similar in the evening rush hour here. You can see a little spike here too um, that's causing some incidents that um, are opening in the afternoon and then they're not cleared until later. That could be because the evening rush hour is there. It takes a little longer for the response teams to arrive and clear the, uh, clear the roads. And then down here, I believe this is uh, things that are spanning multiple days. So, you know, at night they start really early in the morning and, and uh, um, or really late at night and end in the morning or the other way around. So I thought this was pretty interesting. Um, you know, I didn't run this query before, so I, I was mesmerized by it. Um, and then you can do other, other types of views. So these are little bubble graphs. Um, so what I was showing you was the, the heat map graph. This is a bubble graph, and I did um, created month and cars involved. So those two variables, not surprisingly, are not very highly correlated. You know, just because it's happening in August doesn't mean that there will be more cars involved in a, an incident. So the, the correlations are very low there. On the, you know, for August, most of them had one car involved. Um, you know, some of them had more. Here's the other one. Uh, so there was an incident in August that had 22, 23 vehicles involved. So that would be an interesting one to look at. So the whole idea here is it's a huge data set. There's a lot of information. And you could probably spend hours just playing around with it with different time frames, different um, data sets, different variables. Um, so that's it for me. Um, and I think uh, I'm right on time here. So any questions? That was my live demo. <laughs> yes? Uh, I was wondering if, if you had attended as well to put a more predictive analytics in addition to this uh, more descriptive analytics that you have. Yes, um, th that's a good question. We haven't done a lot of predictive stuff at the lab. Um, I think some labs do a better job of it. We haven't been in that market. Um, I think we have access to the data to do some good work with uh, predictive algorithms. So we're actually trying to, we're, we're coming up with some uh, machine learning algorithms that will help us do some predictive stuff in real time so that you, know, you can look at what the current conditions are and estimate what it's gonna be for next 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, something like that. Or also looking back at historical data and trying to figure out, okay, what is the probability that there will be an incident at this location in the future? Uh, based on some of that, um, you know, the, the road conditions, the weather, all this disparate data together. But, you know, we haven't done it yet. Um, it's something that, that we're looking to do. Yes? So, uh, a user download, uh, if a user is interested in this incident uh, or accidents uh, historically to analyze the distribution and probabilities, could a user download the data in a spreadsheet format to their own computer or nobody could uh, download the data? Okay, so, so it depends. Um, what I've shown you here, I mean, this is all web-based, so you would just log in and you say, I want to see this data for this date, and it would, it would generate all that on the, on the server side, and then you would provide, you know, the, as you click around, it generates different queries on the client side. But to answer your question of could you download the data, you could um, for agencies that are willing to share their data. So uh, as I was mentioning in the first part of the presentation, some agencies are more willing to share the data. Some of them love giving the data away because they don't want to deal with, with the data requests. So we built data feeds that you can connect to and actually pull the data in, in real time or archive data. Uh, we also have 
um, download tools that allow you to download some uh, sets of data. But I can tell you that everything that I just showed you is just available to download because certain agencies, some of this is operational data, so, so certain agencies are not willing to share that unless it's um, for another agency, so for collaboration. Um, if you're thinking about general public, then that would be a scrub, scrubbed out data set. But yes, there, there is an av availability of, of downloads. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, have you been contacted by uh, DOTs or anyone that are really interested in more formal status reports, like monthly reports or annual, based on the data that's embedded in it? Yes. So, um, we, we in the lab don't do a lot of uh, reporting, um, so we don't have uh, projects where we monthly generate a report and send it to a DOT. However, we do provide these types of tools. So this is a research tool, but we have some other tools that um, are specifically addressing certain reports that the DOTs are looking for. So they can go and they can sign up for scheduled reports and generate them on a monthly basis or a weekly basis or whatever it is, or for every time period they're interested in. And it will generate these graphics, it'll generate all the information and allow you to either email that information or actually create a report, PDF report that you can print out or email to somebody else. Um, so, so we provide tools to do that, but we don't necessarily do the reports for the DOTs. But yes, many DOTs have approached us um, asking for specific things that they need in their report, and we've built some of that functionality in. Uh, in one of your earlier slides, you had uh, liability and security. Yes. And then Amanda had mentioned firewalls, and IT pops up as the obstacle. So uh, do you guys have suggestions or ways that uh, you have involved IT more to in the sharing of the data or breaking through firewalls? And I know security you know, is an issue, but they're neither uh, an owner of the material or data or nor a user of the data. They're just right. involved in the infrastructure. So, so how do you get around them? That's a, that's a great question, um, you know, and being that I deal with a lot of IT folks, one thing that I found is I just gotta be nice to them. Uh, but one of the things, one of the things that's, uh, that's, that's interesting is that's not the most difficult problem. The most difficult problem a lot of times is uh, getting the right person at the agency to realize what the value of sharing this data is. And once they realize it, they will do what they need to do to start the process. Um, so, so that's one of the difficult things that we have to do. When it comes down to IT, uh, being that we've integrated so many different data sources, we've dealt with many different IT groups, many different consultants, um, you know, contractors, and um, sometimes things take a little bit to do, um, but if you show them and provide assistance in, in you know, okay, what, what, is, what is easiest for you to provide this data or to punch a hole in your firewall, what can we do to you know, expedite that process? It's actually surprising that you know they're willing to do that. Um, you know, sometimes you, you just have to get the right person on the IT team because um, there are folks that will say, "Oh, you know, this this is my private data that you know I don't want anybody to see." Um, but you know, some of the things in terms of the security, um, everything that we do is coming over secure layers, so everything is encrypted. Uh, no data is just being FTP for the most part. There are some data sets where agencies that just don't have other abilities and they don't care if it's visible. That's okay. It's not preferred. But uh, most of the data, I would say 90% of what we get is encrypted and uh, secure. And then it's secure once it gets to us as well. Any other questions? Okay. okay. Thank you. Thanks, Nicola. If you could, uh, Nicola, if you could stay up here too, I'd like to bring our other presenters up as well. Um, try to keep some. We have about 15 minutes here left, so about 10 or 15 minutes. So we'll go ahead and try to keep some of the questions going if we can. But uh, I just kind of like to lead off just with a question for the panel as well. Um, you know, just for the practitioners um, in the room, uh, you know, who are trying to look to you know do these um, you know, massive data integration efforts. Uh, what, what do you see as your biggest challenges, and do you have any lessons, specific lessons learned that you could share with the uh, with the audience? That uh, and I'll, I'll kind of open that up to um, uh, anyone to start. I, I think probably one of the best ones was the one I just heard the question about IT and how he mentioned finding the right champion to overcome that. I, I know. And a lot of our initiatives, we have a lot of people with good ideas, and then something says, well, it can't be done because this obstacle's in the way. And if you get the right champion in the right place, 
most obstacles can be overcome, uh, and it's, it's just a matter of finding the right incentive with the right group at the right time to make that happen. Yeah, it's um, maybe even particularly in government work where we have certain procedures and certain regulations, and uh, yeah, I guess it's just kind of keeping at it and really um, not, not letting things sit in one person's, uh, sit on one person's desk for too long, just making sure that it really moves forward and keeping on it. And to elaborate a little bit on my answer that I was just uh, alluding to in terms of that, the most difficult part is convincing folks at the, at the agencies that this is a good idea to share your data and to open it up. Um, one of the ways that, that that has worked for us is after we've done a lot of legwork at the beginning to do this. Um, oh, thank you. Once we did a lot of legwork at the beginning to, to um, get some data, and we built these applications, then what happens is folks start looking at the application and saying, wow, this really has some value. We're not sharing data just for the sake of saying that we're sharing data. We're actually doing something with it. How do we get in? How, how do we convince our IT? What do we need to tell our IT to share this data? Uh, we're willing to do it. It's just how do we do it? And that's, you know, for us, that's an easier problem. We can handle the technical portion. It's just getting those folks to understand that there is a value to doing that that I thought was a, a, a difficult problem. But as you build the system and you provide that information and they see the value, it gets a little bit easier. So it sounds like, because I know I would, um, the last few years you, you said you had a couple databases behind the firewall and you only were looking at a couple of things. You start off with just one that is visible that, that they would buy into and not try to give them the other 19 at, <laughs> Um, you know, we're, we're talking a lot about just stove types within our own organization, and there were people within one data set saying they don't want the people in the other data set within our organization looking at their data because they would question it, say things could be done differently, not agree with it, um, and that's just not a good practice. So uh, if they weren't willing to make the changes to their own system to make the data more available, that's fine. Just let us have an output of that system, and we'll work on an integration model. And I think they're just taking it a step at a time, and then that makes the next step a little bit easier. I think when you right off the top say, we want to make all this data available to the public in real time, not only could it not be done, but people get overwhelmed by it. And if you say, well, we're going to start with really old data, and we're going to start with just the stuff you're already presenting and make that a little more easy, people start to get comfortable with the tool in the process, and they start to say, well, what else can we put in there? They get excited about it. They get on board. Uh, I know it's made my job easier as I deal with states and MPOs and say data integration is really important. I want to see you doing it. And they say, well, what are you doing? And I have to say, oh, well, we're not doing data integration at the federal level. And now I can say, yes, we have this state integration doing all this. And they can look in question and go, well, your data is not very timely. It doesn't have all the points available. And I say, that's true. I'd like to see you improve upon that and, and take the next step. So every step we take is making the next step a little bit easier. And, and the process is, is getting smoother and smoother as we go along. And uh, the example for us came with this RADS, Recovery Act data system. Uh, people had lots of great ideas for making this data more visual and people said, no, it can't be done, it's too much to ask. 
And then all of a sudden we had this huge influx of money with the whole idea was to make it very transparent to the public what their dollars were getting and how it was paying off in infrastructure. And there was this new requirement. We, we need to immediately see where your projects are, what dollars are going in, the effect and performance. And there was this huge push to get all this data and make that happen. And once it happened, people said, well, gosh, why aren't we getting this all the time on everything else? This is so great. Why didn't we do it? And we had to remind them, you said you didn't want that before. And so it sometimes just takes that enlightenment moment. You just kind of do it, even though IT says not to, you do it anyway. And then, and then it's a lot harder for them to keep you from moving forward. So uh, we haven't ironed out all the processes, even internally. It's not out there, but, but we're a lot further along than we were before. Um, we haven't started doing that yet, but I would love to be able to to do that to use our current system uh, and improve on it to where we can, um, especially once we overcome the firewall issue, to have a data set that's editable by the public where we could get public input on um, just where where they think that they need to see transportation improvements more or sidewalks or whatever. Um, so that's definitely something that we're going to be thinking about in the future. Yesterday, I think there was a se session yesterday on, on crowdsourcing that I unfortunately I missed, and I heard that it was pretty good. Um, I don't know if, you, if, if any of you were there, but um, it, you were there. Have they talked about that at all in terms of integrating the, the crowdsource data? Sure. Well, and, and that's kind of un unstructured data, and I think it might be a little more difficult to integrate, but. I mean, it's got great value if you look at, again, there's another session that's happening right now, and I'm okay saying this now, um, on gamification of, of uh, Waze data that I thought was very interesting. Uh, but it deals with some of that data that they're producing and, you know, looking at how you can in integrate that into some of the systems that we were talking about here. Um, so, you know, I'll have to catch up with somebody from that session and see if they, they have a better answer. <laughs> Right. So, so that's um, <laughs> that's the benefit of working at a university. You know, you get to try out a lot of things and see what works and what doesn't work, and, and it's somewhat of a, a luxury. But um, it depends on the project. So, uh, the Re Regional Integrated Transportation Information System started as a federal earmark, and then the agencies that were participating, so it was Maryland, Virginia, D.C., and WMATA, which is the metro um, agency in D.C. Um, have uh, been supporting the project uh, with annual um, grants to it. So, so that's what's keeping the, the, the core functionality of it going. Now, all the other tools that you're seeing here, and uh, there was a question earlier, but I, I think you were asking about downloading some of the data and doing reports and so on. So some of the functionality that was built into these tools came from um, agencies that said, okay, this is great data. We want to share our data with you. And when they do that, they get access to everybody else's data if, if other agencies are allowing that type of an access. And also all these great tools, but then they say, okay, I, I have a widget X that I really need for mine and it doesn't exist. And we say, okay, you know, the cost of developing that is something. And once it's developed, all the other agencies that are using that tool now have access to that if they have the similar data that they can use. So it's almost like a, um, um, you know, a pooled fund, if you will, you know, p people uh, pay for different um, features and then everybody else gets access. And so far the model has been that, you know, we've been bringing in these agencies that are more interested as the data is getting more opened up. There's more, a there are more agencies that are willing to pay for that type of development. And then there's some core set of 
folks that are um, um, supplying the, the funding. And then there are things like I-95 Corridor Coalition uh, that has purchased some of the INRIX probe data uh, for, the, for the states along the corridor, and there are a lot of folks, DOTs along the corridor, that um, get access to these tools and, and, and get to use them through that I-95 Corridor uh, Coalition contract. Does that answer your question? I mean, it's kind of. Yeah, I mean, because sometimes you, know, you could develop a tool, and that happens to many NPOs, for example. Develop a tool, then nice tools, and then, but in the long term, it's lonely. For example, in Dallas, the NPO now is beginning to charge the private sector, the private company, for access to that information. So they have a lot of information on the website, but you have to have all this information available, they are beginning to charge because funding issues. So maintaining that information all the time costs money, and sometimes, you know, the fiscally constrained, constrained element today, then you have to decide, do I continue spending money in technology versus doing something else? Well, I, I will tell you one thing. I'm not gonna name any specific agencies, but the model of, um, looking at your data as an asset and you know trying to sell it. Um, several states have tried that and, and some are doing it still. Um, I, I will postulate that they weren't very successful in it. Um, and I don't know how long they're gonna go down that path before they realize it, but um, a lot of uh, the stats that I was showing you from that uh, white paper that was put out by Maytock shows that um, you gain some benefits from sharing your data and, and doing funding these types of applications. So you save money in some of your um, operations um, and then you invest that into these types of tools to keep them going because they're helping you. Um, you know, I mean, that's kind of a, a loose connection there, but you know, that's, that's, the, that's the thinking at least that um, you know, we employ. Um, but I mean, you're making a good point. It, it, it isn't, it, it is a concern for a lot of uh, agencies.